Good morning, Crossbridge Church. Thank you so much for joining us for our new series called Activated. We're gonna be talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how we can be activated in our ministry at our church. So if you wanna learn more about that, we're gonna be hearing from Pastor Sam in just a moment. But before we get started, we have a couple of events coming up, starting off with Mi Gente, which is happening November 5th and 6th. Guys, it's time to get your tickets. It's gonna be an incredible event. I'm so excited for it, so don't miss out. Go ahead and get those tickets. Also, we want to let you know that we are having a worship night, September 30th. It's going to be at our Pinecrest campus around 7, and it's going to be absolutely amazing. Our last worship nights were incredible. You can really feel the spirit in the room, and we don't want you to miss out. So we'll see you there. And church, that is all for today. So now, let us worship together. Trust your promise. Never seen you turn away. You have loved me undeserving. Oh, I have seen your mercy. Follow me all my days. Oh, it doesn't make sense how your love is so good. You call me your friend. Too far gone. Now I know you're never gonna let me go. Here we go. You are good, and you can only be good. You can't be anything else. You can't be anything
God activates us to change. It gives us new life. But the power that turns up that knob are the spiritual practices that are made available to us. On today's episode of our current fall series, Activated, we're going to learn and we're going to look at the disciples, at least in part, practice the kingdom of God. Not as a bunch of rules or a bunch of laws, not as a bunch of prescriptions, but as different modes of divine action. These spiritual practices that the Holy Spirit gives us are the means through which God comes to His people and by which His kingdom breaks into the world. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts chapter 2. I'll be reading from verses 36 through 47. Here's what God's Word says to us. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all you who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers together had, you know, they came together and sold everything and had in common. They sold property, possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, the Apostle Peter comes to this moment This is 50 days uh, after the resurrection of Jesus and 10 days after his ascension. And he preaches this sermon. And he tells all of the house of Israel, this, this Jesus, who, by the way, God has exalted God is placed at his right hand. This, this king of the covenant, this one, you crucified. And instead of dragging Peter out and stoning him to death, the verse here tells us that they were cut to the heart. And so God brings them to conviction, which is the Holy Spirit's job. And Peter's sermon and his gift of repentance, it says here 3,000 people professed their faith in Jesus and were baptized and were part of the first, I would argue, mega church. There are a couple of basic things that happens, right? When we, when we practice these core practices that stand out here, firstly, they were devoted to each other. 
This is what it says in verses 46. They broke bread in their homes. They enjoyed, they, they had favor with all of the people. God has designed us in such a way that we need something external to happen to our spirit so that we can be spiritually awakened and spiritually nourished. And in the same way, uh, uh, we need food for our physical nourishment so that every time we're eating, we're reminded of the good news of the gospel. So throughout the gospels, Jesus told a lot of stories, a lot of stories of great banquets, a lot of stories of, uh, of uh, the marriage feast for the king's son, the marriage supper of the lamb. And yet the impression is given that the spirit of that, that future banquet is available to us and can be enjoyed to us or, or even now as eating is connected to the mission of the church as an act of worship. I don't know if you knew that. It's very important to come together and break bread with one another. It's an act of worship. They were also devoted uh, to themselves and it's a fellowship. Verse 42, telling our story is also about worship. I don't know if you knew that either. We, we love, everybody has a story and people express their stories in many different ways through many different mediums. And the reason that we love to tell our stories is because we were created to worship. We were created to reveal the deepest longings of our hearts. We were created to, 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 to reveal what we're passionate about, what, what our values are, what's crucial to our lives. All ultimately what we're living for. The Apostle John says this, I'll read it. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, he says, we have fellowship with one another. 1 John 1, 7. Now the word fellowship uh, uh, here means a heart to heart connection, a community that's in full view of the cross is a group of people who are aware of their own spiritual poverty, who are mourning over their sin, a people who are experiencing the comforts of the, of the gospel, a people who are humble, a people who are hungry and thirsty after righteousness. That's what we see here. And God has been unfolding his story, by the way, since before the foundations of this world were even laid. And, and we're all participants in the story, and we need to understand and see how our lives and the lives of our brothers and sisters intersect. We need to be devoted to each other. Nothing could keep the church, this first church, away from one another because love and the love that they had for their brothers and sisters had become one of the biggest and deepest things in their life. Teaching us this, an unattached Christian life is impossible. There's no such thing as an unattached Christian life. That's why I believe I could argue the modern church is so divided and the modern church is so powerless because we don't really experience this level of intimacy. I don't want to be intimate with you. I don't want to experience this intimacy with you. I don't want you looking into me. I mean, I want you to look at my representative through the lens. I don't want you to look at my reality because maybe then you won't want to tune in next week or, or maybe I, I'm, I'm comfortable keeping my distance from you on stage because then maybe you'll, you'll like me better that way. And, and, and we struggle with this. And sometimes the, the, the struggle is we don't like what we see in the mirror. And we lie to ourselves. We look in the mirror. We don't want to admit and accept what we see. And, and we put a mask on, not realizing that people in this world are craving. They are craving authentic relationships. But if we want to grow, we got to get close. We got to get closer with the people who are in our lives. And we got to stop pretending that we have it altogether. I, I don't know if you're, if you're into social media, uh, most people are, but you ever scroll through social media and see, see some of these people's stories and just kind of look and look and say, liar, <laughs> that's a lie. You're not that way. She's not that way. And all of these lies, what they do subconsciously is they make us trust these people less and less. People don't need us to be perfect. On the other hand, people don't need us to be basket cases either, just over, you know, word vomit and kind of over dramatizing our, our experiences in order to draw attention to ourselves. Healthy, devoted relationships are built when both parties are growing. They are growing when you're able to see something in your life that you want to change and you surround yourself and you confess those things to trusted people that are going to help you grow and begin to help you change. Paul says it this way in Colossians. He says this, he says, do not lie to each other. Stop putting on that mask. Since you've taken off your old self, that old mask, with its practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. And so they were devoted, the Bible says here, to each other. They were also devoted in prayer. 
Verse 42, they devoted themselves not only to fellowship, but also in prayer. Jesus said his temple will be, a, his house will be a house of prayer. J, uh, James tells us, the apostle, he tells us that the prayers of the righteous has great power in its effect. Devoting ourselves means that we're dedicating ourselves in constant action to the appointed task. We're dedicating ourselves, we're committing ourselves in constant action to the appointed tax. We're pressing in on it. So, for example, in Romans 13, when Paul talks about the role of government and how uh, the rulers of government are servants of God, they're, they're devoting themselves to that very thing. They're giving themselves over to that very... He's saying they're not only designated by God to the task, but they're giving themselves to it. Are you giving yourselves over to prayer. Are you praying? Now, this doesn't mean that prayer is all you do, like 24-7. That's all you do. You're just going to pray. Any more than being devoted to your wife means that you're going to be, uh, uh, or, you know, the husband, 20, every, every second of the day you're going to be with, you're going to be hanging out with her. That's not what it means. But your devotion, if you are married as a husband, uh, your devotion as a husband uh, 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 to her affects everything in your life. It's causing you to give yourself over to your wife in a lot of different ways. And in regards to prayer, it means that there will be a pattern of praying. And it won't be the same for everyone, but it'll be something significant for everybody. Now, I don't know if you've uh, ever played the game how far, but uh, the game and the rules of the game are rather simple. If you're driving a car and you've ever said, you know what, I'm going to let this little line, this little E line get to as close to E as possible. You know, the little gas tank, uh, gas tank light lit, lights up. And you say, I wonder how far my car can get before I need to fill it up again. We, we've played that game maybe, or maybe we've thought about it. Maybe we we're scared to play that game. But a, a, a lot of us play this game with our spiritual gas tank. How far, how far can I get in life without a single fill-up? If you're praying, if you're having fellowship with one another, only when crisis happens, you know what you're doing? You're playing how far? You're playing that game. These, these, these hit and miss prayers of, oh God, and oh sweet baby Jesus, help me. Now there's nothing wrong with those prayers. It's appropriate. But I think for a movement to take place in the body of Christ, there's something more and something different has got to happen with the followers of Jesus. Are we devoted to fellowship? Are we devoted? Are there patterns of prayer in our life? Is there a pattern of these things in our life? Both things are hard because we tend to, to we, we tend to make things about ourselves, and we tend to lean on our own strength. But let me tell you something. This competitive me first attitude was gone. It was gone in the early church. It wasn't there. This is not just togetherness. This is unity, as I preached about last week. This is this is unity. They were united. This is not just human affection. This is genuine love. They knew that God is with, was with them. They knew that God was powerfully at work with them. And as a result, there was a constant mood of celebration of everything that they did. And this is the spirit that we want to see in all of our activities, in all of our gatherings here at Crossbridge Church, not just in Miami Springs, but in our other locations. Because as a result, we will see the fruit of the movement and the story that God is inviting us into. These are the signs that we see of this movement. We also see the fruit of the movement. I want you to picture a future with me. What if God were to add 3,000 people to our church tomorrow? How would we care for them? How would we, uh, how, how would we build them up? How would we gather them in, into worship? I believe the answer is to multiply churches, to plant churches. Being one church in several different locations means that as the church grows, every other church, and we see that in the New Testament, ends up resourcing one another for exponential growth. If a band of radical disciples of Jesus are able to keep a pilgrim mindset and believe in expanding vision of the local church, then multiplying church is not only feasible and affordable, but it is under this united banner of spreading the gospel in all things and for the joy of the people through Jesus Christ. And my prayer, my prayer is that the vision of the gospel will spread through the city, will grip our hearts, will be the means of bringing thousands of people into our community. Why? Well, because God is 
is passionate first. He's passionate about changed lives. Verse 41 and, and 47, those who accepted the message were baptized. It says here, to the Lord was adding daily those who were being saved. We, we plant, we water, but God gives life. It is God that gives life. Jesus says, I will build up my church. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. Church strategies are cool. Church systems are cool, but they're not decisive. At the end of the day, God is decisive. And we cannot operate out of the assumption that if we knew the exact structure of the Jerusalem church, and if we knew the exact structure of the Corinthian church, then, you know, uh, uh, we will have the exact same church as the earth. We will have power in the exact same way that the early church. However, th that's, not, that's not the way it works. On the other end, and not thinking through a strategy, not having a plan, not having a structure, not having a winning attitude of shepherding and seeing more and more people is a strategy, by the way. It's a heartless one. We got to be thinking about people. And so our vision for church planning, it's not just about church expansion. It's not a, it's not a small thing for us. It's not the icing of the cake to say that we're catalytic to a gospel movement. It's the calling of God in our lives among hundreds and thousands of people in our city who are lost. Now, presently, as we gather as a church, uh, not just in Springs, but in other locations as well, my hope and the hope of the leadership and the elders here at this church is that we, we want to inspire you to have a sense of significance in being a part of this gospel movement, to, to win and bring you closer into really loving Jesus more and more, to call you into a deeper investment of your life in the advancement of this, this vision, really, to see lives change because it matters to God. Secondly, we see here changed attitudes. Notice in verses 44 and 45, it says, They had everything in common. They sold possessions to anyone who had need. Poor people were here. Rich people were here. They joined the church. And those who had more uh, uh, than they needed, they sold something they possessed, and they gave those resources to those who were in need so that no one was in need. Everybody had bread to eat. We see here both physical and spiritual things being met in a holistic approach to ministry. Now, there's no such thing. Listen to me, there's no such thing as a Christian Scrooge. There's no such thing as a stingy Christian. If you claim to be a Christian, then you should never be stingy. You can't really claim to really know Jesus and have a tight fist on your possessions, on your things. The, the, the reason generosity is one of the greatest evidences of truly being a Christian is because of our Savior, because Jesus gave everything for us. Our greatest treasure, he demonstrated the ultimate act of generosity in coming to save us. Listen, listen to how Paul says it. He says it this way in 2 Corinthians. He says, though he was rich, Jesus, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by, you his, by his poverty you might become rich. Now, givers, I use this illustration in the past, can be divided into, into you know, three types of givers. You have a flint that flint that needs that you need to kind of rub together to start a fire. Some givers are like flints, right? You guys got to, you know, you got to bang them and, and just kind of, and all you get is sparks at the end of the day. Some givers are like sponges. You just got to squeeze the sponge in order to get any water out of it. And some givers are like honeycombs. They just produce, they're generous, they're sweet. Uh, it just overflows with sweetness. This is what the early Christians were known for. Man, it was just, especially for those within the fellowship. In fact, the Roman emperor Julius took notice of this. And then he instructed his pagan rulers, hey, you need to be more like the Christians. Listen to what, uh, listen to what uh, he says. He, he was, he was, he was uh, uh, angry at the Christians or he was angry at the Christian movement progressing because it was pulling people away from Rome and worship from the Roman gods. He says this, he says, atheism. By the way, atheism was known uh, uh, f uh, uh, Christians were called atheists back in the first century because they only believed in one God and not uh, they weren't pluralistic like the Romans. Anyway, atheism has been especially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers. Again, atheism, Christian faith, and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there's not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor but for ours as well. 
while those who belong to us look in vain for help that we should be rendering to them. My God, this, this movement that we're all a part of us uh, 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 wants to produce a people who are investing their, their finances and their talents and their time and their energies, whose calendars and checkbooks reflect kingdom priorities because one of the effects of the gospel going deeper into our souls is that it frees our, our fingers, it loosens our grip and our grasp on the goods and material things that God has given us. If Jesus is in us, then we will increasingly, over time, be, have this open-handed uh, uh, tendency because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I, I thank God for the year that he's given us this year, 2022. I think we're in good shape as a church, if you ask me. People are coming, people are growing. When we look at the condition of the church as a whole, I look forward to what God has in the days ahead. But we got to acknowledge the fact that we cannot do what God calls us to do on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to humbly rely on the Holy Spirit's power, have eyes open to the possibilities of service that exist all around us. We need to give attention to becoming everything God saved us to be. We need to get busy doing the things that God has already revealed to us and birthed in our hearts. And in order to be devoted in prayer, in order to be devoted to one another, in order to have attitudes and lives changed, we need to continually fill our spiritual gas tank with what fueled the early church in its mission. And this is the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus pours his spirit out on us, even next year, I'm looking to 2023, my prayer is that we will be fueled for service. Amen. Church, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful example of the early church who continually devoted themselves to apostolic teaching, Christian fellowship, breaking of bread, authentic prayer. Lord, as we look for, for, for the any day return of our Lord Jesus Christ, may we follow the wonderful example of these early members of Christ's body. And may we grow in grace and in the knowledge of you as we seek to share the truth of the gospel, of the grace of God, with everybody we meet in humility and in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey friends, thank you for watching. Uh, go ahead and like and subscribe this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And remember, you can join me in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you for watching.